<laughs> All right. Thank you kindly for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, before I begin, as a non-Indigenous guest, it's important for me to acknowledge that I'm here today on unceded land, a gathering place of many First Nations, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg Nations, First Nations who have served as this land's stewards since time immemorial. So I'm Kale Passmore, a PhD student from University of Saskatchewan's Human Computer Interaction Lab. And today I have the privilege of sharing the lessons we've learned from players of more than 24 different ethnic backgrounds. And the research myself, Max Burke and Regan Mandrick have done on player diversity and ethnic representations in games. So we know that digital games are enjoyed by a diverse range of players. We know a greater proportion of people of color play games, identify as gamers, and own gaming systems than their white, non-Hispanic counterparts. Speaking to player experiences, we know effective representation is tied to so much of what makes digital gaming beneficial, from a lasting sense of agency to mood repair and reductions in biases. These effects, however, hinge on the player's relationship with their digital representations. So, Let's start with an assumption that factors like ethnicity, race, gender, sexuality, ability are core to our sense of identity. And if our sense of identity is inextricable from how we identify with others, real and digital, then the diversity of our games needs to reflect the diversity of its players. But it currently doesn't. When we look to the majority of digital game protagonists, we see a lot of white, we see a lot of brown hair, we see a lot of hyper-masculine men. If we take identification studies seriously, access to the benefits and player experiences of gaming are thus not equal, not accessible to most players. Which is why there's an issue when we see the actual rates of ethnic diversity of in-game characters across AAA and indie games alike. On the basis of ethnicity alone, we see extreme under-representation for characters of color and over-representation for white Caucasian characters. So in 2015, when we saw that Pew had conducted a survey showing that almost 70% of Americans felt digital games were either sufficiently diverse or were unsure if minorities required better representation, we were surprised. How do we reconcile the fact that gamers of color game in greater proportion than their white, non-Hispanic counterparts with these staggering rates of underrepresentation? Did the minorities in Pew's study just not know they aren't receiving the same benefits from gaming? Does ethnicity and digital representation just not matter? If identification really does matter to player experience, why aren't we seeing numbers in studies like this one from Pew reflecting the lack of ethnic diversity and the associated barriers to player experience? To understand why 70% 70, 70 of players reported feeling fine or unsure about in-game representation, we need to consider the differences in perspectives between players who are underrepresented and players who are overrepresented. First, from prior studies and lived experiences, we see and hear from underrepresented players that gaming's current state of diversity is no, no poorer a representation than we've learned to expect from American and Eurocentric media. Underrepresentation is normalized. Discrimination, unequal access is unremarkable. For people of color, coping under white norms um, can take on many forms. Most commonly, Coping strategies take shape in terms of psychological disengagement, learn neutrality, low expectation, normalization. That is to say, many Americans of color find this lack of diversity how things are, as one player put it. In discussions with overrepresented players, we hear a lack of awareness of the issue for reasons like colorblindness a kind of bias that can leave the values and impact of discrimination reduced in severity, overlooked, or unseen entirely. Challenged on this, tokenized examples of characters of color are selectively discussed, the issues surrounding underrepresentation diffused, the problem unaddressed. Norms and heuristics are harder to see the more established they are. And this is why norms and representation can flatten or render invisible the benefits of experiences like identifying with in-game characters, and the degree of homogeneity, here, whiteness of characters, goes unseen by players who do not experience poor representation firsthand. 
Speaking of those who reap the continual benefits of access to identification in gaming, those who are represented frequently can take representation as a given, as unremarkable, unimportant, as normal. What this means is that researchers can fail to achieve ecological validity or even construct accuracy when they lack control for norms, when they fail to separate perceptions from beliefs from expectations, as seen in sampled populations where, for example, colorblindness minimizes the issue under study for some, while for others, discrimination is felt unremarkable, even normal. So maybe Pew was right. 70% of people think the current state of ethnic diversity in gaming is okay. And this formed the crux of the problem we wanted to investigate. Are people okay with this lack of ethnic diversity in their digital games, or are they just used to it? As identity factors, experiences, values, beliefs, perceptions, and norms entangle, we did not feel we could break adequate ground with just one isolated research question. So we asked about 92, each centered around the major themes that you see here. How do players understand their ethnic identities? Are these identities valuable? Are they meaningful to game experiences? If we center or prime one's ethnic racial identity, do we start seeing different data than is commonly reported? Of course, these questions involve, directly involve norms, coping strategies, biases. So in order to overcome norms and coping strategies that can distort player data, we built our survey iteratively in collaboration with a diverse range of players across ethnicities. We employed a combination of identity-based motivation theory, social identity theory, and critical race theory to counteract biases, isolate these norms from player experiences, from beliefs, from desires, and most importantly, to engender participant trust for revealing these deeper experiences and beliefs. Participants were given 92 questions, concentrating around the themes that you can see here, in the forms of Likert scales, choose all that apply, and multiple choice questions, as well as a series of open-ended questions for thematic and semantic analysis. Our 286 participants were organized in, into racial groupings, self-defined, importantly, through open-ended questions for accuracy and sensitivity that exceeds other methods, like you might see in, say, census data. And in the initial draft of the paper, I actually had an entire page dedicated to best practices for assigning racial groupings. But on top of the 92 questions, it got a little bit burdensome, so we had to make some cuts. Um, there's still a significant section in there that I encourage you to go check out, read, even critique. So they didn't slot me with time to go over all 92 questions in the survey or in the paper for that matter, but I will touch on some key findings that show players are dissatisfied with character representations in gaming. First, we needed to confirm whether ethnicity is important to gaming experiences. We asked if players agreed with the statement, it is important for me that digital gaming include experiences built around my race, ethnicity, heritage, or ancestry. Black group players agreed significantly more than white group players. Players of color agreed that playing games in which my race and or ethnicity is accurately represented improves my gaming experience. And if representation is important to players, we wanted to ask the question, are they getting the representation that they want? For white players, Generally, yes. They agreed significantly more than players of color that they encountered characters in digital games that accurately represent my race or ethnicity. White grouped players agreed that the digital games industry currently represents enough racial or ethnic diversity, significantly more than black or Hispanic grouped players who were below neutral in their level of agreement. Players of color agreed that most human characters I encounter in digital games are white which is more accurate to the data we see on under-representation, whereas white players were neutral in their agreement. White players here agreed significantly less than black or Hispanic grouped players. Worse still, even when characters of color do exist, their representations are inauthentic or seen as offensive. Players across racial groupings agree most non-white characters are stereotypes, and black players agreed significantly more than white players here. So we asked participants whether they encountered racial stereotypes in digital games. Participants responded differently depending on their racial grouping, surprise, surprise. 
Black players reported a higher frequency of encountering racial stereotypes than white players, for example. We conducted a qualitative analysis on themes present um, that were related to discrimination and motivation to game um, in analysis. Experiences of discrimination we operationalized as descriptions of negative affect directly associated with feeling of, feelings of being unjustly silenced, unwelcomed, minimized, stigmatized, missed or unrepresented due to unchanging attributes of self, uh, skin color, gender, race, etc. 42% of our participants described these intrusive, recurring experiences of discrimination, which were often associated with sources in development. 83% of all the discrimination that we coded was associated with development and industry as its primary source. Um, and sub-themes here referred to explicit racism, so stereotypical game characters, demeaning narratives, misrepresentations as well as institutional racism, like tokenism, absence of representation, etc. 38% of total discrimination themes were associated with other players, um, almost exclusively in online play and in the form of racial slurs. And a sub-theme of institutional racism expressed discrimination through technical aspects in gaming. This was like environmental lighting or costume design not being balanced for non-white characters white voice actors playing characters of color or mispronunciation of names. So 31% of the total reports of discrimination in gameplay came from white participants, one third of which were referring to gender or heteronormativity issues. 44% of um, these were coming from our Asian group participants. 45% um, from black group participants and 52% from Hispanic uh, participants. So players of all backgrounds want greater ethnic diversity, but players of color clearly want this in greater proportion. And this is in part because players of color value their ethnic identity more. They feel experiences of accurate representation have greater experiential value. They face far more discrimination. And in their words, quote, feel more immersed in my gaming experience when I can self-represent. White players want greater ethnic diversity as well. And although they value their ethnic identity less and their perception of the issue is lower, they do both perceive a great degree of the mis- and under-representation of non-white players. And they also feel this harms or limits their gaming experiences. So as one player put it, Get genuine, honest stories and experiences from diverse people, and you'll never run out of ideas. It's a little, literal gold mine when you look for interesting stories from different races and ethnicities and genders. There's enough brown-haired white guys with guns saving the day. All right, so I'm going to leave you with a final result that we have here. We asked players to agree with the statement, how do you feel about playing a white character in a video game? As you can see, most players agreed playing white characters has never been a problem or I'm used to it. White players exceeded players of color across quali qual oh, sorry, positive qualifiers for this, saying I enjoy it. However, most players of color felt neither positively nor negatively about playing white characters. If we leave out the context of players or other relevant data like psychological coping strategies, norms, um, it can look as though people of color feel playing white characters is fine, it's all right. This is the sense that the Pew study we referenced in the beginning gives readers. However, if we set these responses into the context of our results, contextualize the data as we do in our paper, we see a marked difference between what it means to be used to a norm and what players want. Returning to our core research question, yes, people are okay with the current state of ethnic diversity, they're used to it, but we have to ask the question, is keeping players used to underrepresentation and offensive misrepresentation our goal as developers and designers? In true qualitative fashion, I could spend a day discussing each of our results. Um, so if you read our paper, and I think this is about the fifth time I've hyped this paper, so just please go and read it. Um, we set our results into discussion with other studies, explaining why experiences must be distinguished from norms, um, methodological concerns key to player experience research. 
we discuss differences between racial ethnic experiences in gaming, um, effects of representation on player experience, and what happens when representation is lacking, as well as why this matters. We also provide developer feedback from participants and advice for game and research design. So to recap, our methods quali qualitatively, quantitatively, and theoretically support the case for implementing greater ethnic diversity in digital gaming representations. White players are more satisfied with their racial ethnic representations in games, and despite valuing their ethnic identities more, players of color are coping with inaccurate, unavailable, and discriminatory representations. Normative is not neutral, and like real-world conditions, players of color are employing coping mechanisms to engage in digital gaming environments full of stereotypes um, and offensive misrepresentations. Though our paper explores a great deal more, um, in closing, I'd like to return us to the stakes of these matters, the daily experiences of players. We're all part of this history where darker skin, native accents, Afro-textured hair, fuller bodies, traditional clothing have been cause enough for threats of daily violence, internment, slavery, stigma, discrimination, genocide. Within this context, then, how can we really compare the experiences of players of color given an opportunity to proudly, safely, and accurately represent who they are within, with the experiences of players who feel so overrepresented, as our data shows, they're bored? The magnitude of these differences is enormous. And we're seeing more and more research showing that virtually embodying ethnically different characters lowers implicit racial biases both immediately and in the long term. So combined with the myriad other player benefits, digital games give us an opportunity right now to flip this history, even if it's just for a moment. It is those, as our data shows, who face the systematic discrimination that have the most to benefit from changes in digital gaming's norms. And our data shows that players of all ethnicities see this, at least to some extent. So long as it's done with inclusion, integrity, and accuracy, all of this means we have an incredibly exciting opportunity here. What players want and the socially responsible, transformative thing are currently the same. And that's exciting. So to end uh, with a quote from our participant, I've never played a game with a female Latina lead. Not one. I can't even name one game that features a Latina sidekick. I'm sure there are some, but it's such a fringe thing that I've never been able to experience a fantasy world through the actions of someone like me. Thank you. Hi, Kale. Really nice talk. Thank you very much. Scott Bateman, uh, University of New Brunswick. Um, I, I know this wasn't part of your research, but I'm just obviously you've given this a great deal of thought. I guess. Mm. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on what, um, if you were to give sort of a similar survey to game developers and game designers, what do you think the results would look like? IGDA did something similar just a couple years ago where they were asking them about what sort of differences and changes they'd like to see in industry um, and changes to sort of like having greater racial and ethnic diversity was just below sort of like changes to the problematic gender dynamics we saw. I think it was something along the lines of like 46% were wanting that as like the second thing that needs to be tackled after gender. Hi, Julia Brich from Om University. Um, this data set seems like a, a treasure trove. So are you going to publish the, the same um, are they the same data with different lenses? Yeah, um, we would like to. Funding and what future projects are <laughs> is a little bit uncertain, but we've just finished a paper looking at a whole different sort of way of looking at a lot of the same data, more focused on like character features, what mm -hmm. kinds of like aspects of digital representation are important in face or narrative or things like that. But I think that one of the major limitations of this paper is its lack of like focus on applying this intersectionally. Mm -hmm. Like, as no one should be surprised, it was black grouped women that experienced the most distinction, like discrimination, right? Mm -hmm. So being able to look at that data 
from a few different angles and then bring it all together is something I would love to be able to do in the long term. Yeah, if you turn it into a book, I'll totally buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Amy Ogan from Carnegie Mellon, and I love this work. It's really fantastic. I, I was just curious um, that it seems like there's very recently beginning to be a revolution in TV and uh, and in representation there and I wondered if there are any lessons to draw from those experiences whether they apply in the gaming world uh, and whether this is even more important given mm. the direct embodiment um, that people can experience in gaming compared to watching a, a TV character on on the screen yeah um, I feel like I can't speak to that personally and time will sort of tell like we are seeing like black panther crushed in terms of ratings and sales yeah. and things like that but what i can say is like we had a handful of participants even from this study directly referencing like gaming needs to learn from hollywood not replicate its slow progress to something that's a little bit more diverse like mm -hmm it has the potential to be there and get there much quicker and not just repeat the same mistakes from older forms of media. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Well, let's thank all of our speakers today again.